In this section, I'll be taking you through my own personal experience of the CHC application process. The structure of this section will be to trace through the timeline of events as I experience them and conclude with a few key points for you to take away. It's worth noting that my case was a long and difficult one, and so it shouldn't be taken as a typical example. To face some of the individual issues that I encountered, however, is quite common, and so it does serve as a useful case study. So my story began in the Salisbury Spinal Injury Centre, where I had a lot of health issues. For the most part, I was stuck in my bed with a grade four pressure sore, numerous kidney infections accompanied by autonomic dysreflexia. I had a lot of spasms and I had a lot of neurogenic pain. So naturally I was in a lot of medication as well. So as I say, I was stuck in my bed and care funding for when I discharged wasn't really high in my priority list at the time. However, it was something that my family were thinking a lot about. And so my dad attended a funding talk being given by one of the specialist care agencies. One of the things they mentioned was the postcode lottery aspect of CHC. When it came to the end of the presentation, my dad asked the presenter, you know, we live in Wiltshire, what would your advice be for us if we're trying to get CHC funding? And in all honesty, she said, I think you should move house. You should try and move to another county because it's so difficult to get CHC funding there. So that wasn't really an option for us. So my dad instead decided to learn as much about CHC as he could and so attended the SIA masterclass on care funding. Following that, he realised that my health needs were clearly greater than Pamela Coughlin, who was discussed in the previous section. And so we organised my CHC checklist meeting with my, my multidisciplinary team. So my MDT consisted of a social worker who we quite liked and a nurse assessor who we didn't like. She was very hostile and we generally felt she was out to try and marginalise my needs wherever possible. Uh, during the session, my mum was in tears because she felt that my life was being taken away from me before it even started. But nevertheless, the outcome of the of the checklist was that I should have a full assessment. They did, however, say that that would take place until after I was discharged from the hospital because my needs might change in the meantime. Now, that is in contravention, essentially in contravention of the national framework, which states that a full decision should be made about CHC 28 days after the checklist session. And the way it should work is, even if your situation changes with your, if your needs change, the three month review should essentially catch that and remove your funding at that point in time. But your assessment itself shouldn't really be delayed. Anyway, so after that point, uh, my health issues continued and I was delayed for another two months purely on my health issues but once it became better and I was ready to discharge uh, I was delayed a further six weeks purely based on the fact that social services and uh, the NHS couldn't agree on how to fund the interim care for me while the CHC assessment was taking place. So straight away you see the problem with my previous point that if care, if CHC hasn't been decided before you leave hospital, it's not clear who pays for it in the interim. So this, this carried on and was only unlocked when I threatened my MP, my MP's involvement. 
at which point they quickly decided that they would grant me a joint funded package whereby social services would pay for four visits a day to double up um, over my 24-hour PA that the NHS would pay for. And in fact, it turned out that the four extra visits a day were completely unnecessary, so I stopped them quite quickly. So the result was that the NHS were paying for my PA anyway, um, which seemed a little bit uh, a little bit odd given that uh, I'd, uh, I'd I'd blocked a bed in a specialist unit for essentially six weeks unnecessarily. So one month after my discharge. I met again with my multidisciplinary team for my full assessment. We came to that prepared with a list of all my care needs, broken down by the 12 domains of care as discussed in the previous section. So they liked that, they took that away and they said, oh, this is great, this is pretty much everything we need. And so it was actually quite a short session. Now, the one thing that, that was anomalous, however, was that um, my friend, the nurse assessor, um, spoke to me when no one else was in the room and asked me whether I had any uh, uh, income, what my financial situation was. Now, CHC is not means test, so she has no she had no right to do that. Um, and it later turned out that she had done the same thing with my mum. She had asked my mum if I had any income uh, when she was in the room just with her. So um, that was again in contravention of the national framework. So after that meeting, they had said it would only be a few weeks before they would have my decision support tool prepared but uh, there were continual delays in them scheduling their meetings to uh, decide upon my decision support tool. And in fact, it carried on for months and months. They needed to ask for my district nurse and my care agency to provide supporting evidence. And in fact, there was so many delays that they had to ask for that twice. And it took a month each time to gather up that information. So that really delayed things even further. While I was waiting, I was discussing the delays with the SIA CHC advisor. And he suggested one thing I should do is take uh, the detailed list of uh, needs that I had sent and produce a Pamela Coughlin comparison, um, which in fact was supplied by the SIA and send them in and, you know, state the, the, the legal aspect of my application when compared to Pamela Coughlin. So I did that, I didn't really hear much, much about it. And it's worth noting that I wasn't just sitting back waiting for something to happen. I was sending many emails and phone call, making many phone calls and receiving a lot of excuses for why they hadn't made a decision as yet. And eventually they finally did complete the DST and it arrived in April 2013, which was a full year after the checklist session versus the 28 days that I previously mentioned. The result was a flat refusal, despite uh, over the phone, the nurse assessor indicating that a joint funded package would probably be awarded, which although not ideal and not the result I was looking for, it would have been better than the flat refusal. So and on inspection, the DST had significant procedural failings. First and foremost, that uh, my needs where they were well managed had been marginalised. Now, as discussed in the previous section, a well managed need is still a need. Yeah, they had overlooked that. 
domain 12, which is the domain where any uh, needs that are specific to a uh, medical condition should be uh, listed separately and scored as a separate domain that had been completely overlooked despite my uh, list of needs having specifically specified dysreflexia and various other items there. So they, they, they hadn't used that, meaning that I had one section that should have been scored, which wasn't. There had also been failings in the way that they had made decisions. Now, both of my DST, sorry, my, my multidisciplinary team members should have been at all the decision-making sessions, yet the social worker was not available for the main session and was replaced by a stand-in who had never met me before and wasn't familiar with my case. And that was in contravention of the national framework as it states that anyone making decisions about me should be familiar with me and should have met me and should be uh, aware of all my issues and aspirations. So my next priority was to plan my appeal. So I met in person with the SIA CHC advisor at SIA House in Milton Keynes. He suggested that we structure my appeal into three sections. The first would be based on the procedural failings, as I've just mentioned, to go through them one by one. The second, to talk about the legal aspect of my uh, refusal. Uh, which essentially was to compare Pamela Coughlin to myself and say why my needs were in excess of hers and thereby why I was due their funding legally. The third section was to go through each of my domains of care and explain why they had been uh, down, downplayed and, and scored poorly. So the letter was submitted and at the same time I submitted a letter to my MP explaining the, what happened and a letter to my CCG chairman. Now this was at the time when the PCTs were converting to CCGs and I noticed that the chairman of my CCG was in fact one of the GPs at my local practice. Now I'd had various other problems with the PCT before that time. So I sent him a letter saying all these problems. And I said, congratulations on your appointment to the, the chair of the CCG. And just, I thought it'd be useful for you to know the kind of organization that you're taking over. Here are all the problems I've faced. Hopefully you can effect some change. So, so to these two, uh, in reply to these two letters, I did get responses. So I got one from the MP um, saying that he would look into the matter. And in fact, he sent a letter himself to the CCG asking that the matter be looked into. And I also got a response from not the chairman, but the chief officer, so the second in charge of the CCG. And in each case, in each of my grievances, I was um, essentially told that I had misunderstood what had happened in each case. And there was no fault on their part, no blame. And uh, there was no, no, nothing to answer for. And they said that although I had lodged an appeal, maybe it would be better to first have the CHC lead, lead assessor come to visit me to review my case. So that indeed happened. Uh, she came along and she was actually new to Wiltshire and was quite shocked, to be honest, at the stories that we told her about what had been going on. We provided her with uh, a detailed list of the national framework infractions as we saw them. In fact, we gave her a printout of the entire national framework with little sticky tabs and highlights stating where the problems lay and so she thanked us for that and away she went but nothing happened 
and uh, really we should have heard um, 12 weeks after submitting the appeal, after it had been received, the national framework states that a decision should be made after 12 weeks, but we had heard nothing. So at 15 weeks, I replied to the CCG letter that I had got back from the chief officer. And in each case, I uh, made clear why I didn't think that I was misguided and why I felt that I had been um, wronged in each case. Uh, and one of the comments I had made was that Wiltshire was at the wrong end of the postcode lottery with regards to CHC. Now, in response, she had stated, I don't know where you've um, heard that CHC is a postcode lottery. It most certainly is not. CHC is regionally and nationally benchmarked and Wiltshire are not at the uh, are not an outlier. So I said to again to the CHC advisor at the SIA, you know, is there a way that I can um, demonstrate that Wiltshire are bad because you know I've heard all these all these stories about how bad they are and from the the um, the person that gave the presentation at you know that my dad went to at the beginning. And so we heard a lot of anecdotal evidence that there were problems. So he pointed us to um, uh, a quarterly spreadsheet, which is produced and uh, published by the government, which states for each CCG exactly how many awards are being made for CHC and the population in each. So from that, you can tell, you know, per head of population. Uh, how many, um, uh, you know, how likely it is that someone might get CHC. Now, I used to be a, a financial software developer, so I went to town on this thing and, um, uh, you know, did some st statistical analysis and produced a, a nice chart that I sent to her. Now, uh, it looked uh, like the, the following. So the legend reads, how generous is this PCT within the postcode lottery? The chart shows the position of this PCT within the list of all PCTs ordered by CHC awards per 50,000, expressed as a percentile. Now that's pretty wordy, but what it essentially means is, if you look at the very beginning of the chart, where the line starts at roughly 70, and what that says, is that Wiltshire was uh, making more CHC awards per 50,000 people than around 70% of all the other CCGs in the country. Now, the next quarter that had dropped quite significantly to 50. So they were only making more CHC awards per 50,000 people than 50% of the other CCGs. So, uh, as you can see, as time went on, it, it, it kind of came back up a bit, but then uh, uh, just just after the midpoint, it dropped significantly quarter on quarter until right at the very end, it's you know getting pretty close to zero, which, as you can imagine, is exactly where I was making my CHC application. In fact, of around 100. 60 or so PCTs, there were only four that were making fewer CHC awards than Wiltshire. So I sent this uh, in my letter and said, how can you possibly tell me that Wiltshire are not an outlier uh, and, that, and that CHC is not a postcode lottery? So I sent away that letter and then lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, I was called up by the CHC lead assessor who said they had reviewed my case and they felt that they could, uh, uh, my needs had changed somewhat and that uh, they could update my DST 
and award me CHC without conducting an appeal. So in fact, what I took that to mean, and again, this was just my opinion, that by going through an appeal, it brings uh, attention to my case. Potentially, uh, it would have external people looking at my case and making judgments over how it had been conducted. Um, or at the very least, it might give them some bad statistics about how many appeals uh, appear on uh, in their department. So clearly, appeals are something that they want to avoid at all costs. Um, but in any case, yes, uh, I was finally awarded CHC in the end. So, key points to take away. This is a very difficult process for an individual to go through, not least at the very beginning. Just trying to think about your care needs in the right way, such that you don't actually marginalise them yourself. It's important to get advice on how to do that, how to think about what your needs are, even before going into the checklist session. Now, that's one thing. An entirely different thing is having to fight against a hostile process, which really seems to be, you know, have the odds stacked up against you when the people who are assessing you aren't even playing by the rules. Now, my father and I, who, my father um, uh, gave up his job when I had my accident, so he was newly retired. And uh, between the two of us, we're two professional people, um, pretty intelligent, and there was no way we were going to be um, cheated out of what was due to us. Um, and we guessed that you know, between one thing and another, this probably took us three man months of effort in order to gain CHC funding. And, you know, that's not just writing emails and writing letters, that's, that's involving yourself deeply in documents like the National Framework, you know, a thick, a thick government document, an obscure document that really members of the public should have no business looking at at all. Uh, so it's very difficult and requires a lot of effort and intelligence. Um, and even, and even with that, you know, the value of an advisor throughout cannot be understated, not just to um, educate you in the way that you need to think and the arguments you need to make, but also just for uh, the sake of morale. When, uh, when after a year I was refused, uh, my, my, my family and I were like, right, this is, this is the end. I don't know if we can keep going with this. And the SIA advisor said, well, listen, you've got to you've got to keep going. This is this is where we expect to be at this point. We don't feel disheartened. You know, this is us just getting started now. And the value of that was massive. Uh, issues with assessors. So as I've made very clear, uh, the nurse assessor was you know was a real piece of work. Lack of empathy. You know, felt you you feel like thinking about these people and, and imagine asking them, what do you do for a living? Oh yeah, well, I assess uh, the needs of disabled people and try and downplay them as much as possible and uh, deny them uh, funding for their care uh, wherever I can. But yeah, well, do you, do, do you feel, uh, do you feel this is satisfying work? <laughs> um, but it's not just down to badness. This is this is like poor knowledge of the national framework. The people that are assessing uh, candidates, I'm convinced that they they don't actually fully understand uh, how they're supposed to be assessing people and judging people. Like the whole idea of like we've got here marginalisation of needs. I don't think most of them realise that a well managed need is still a need. Um, my own. CHC reviewer, who's my district nurse, I've talked to at length about this, 
and he really does think that you know a well managed need is a need and it shouldn't be the same thing. Please explain to him well then you're breaking the law and this is you're you're not acting in accordance with the law here. Um and you know in the end I I went through my, my view with him. But it's uh you know it's it's a big problem. The Pamela Coughlin comparison, I think it's very important to include that comparison there. Now at no point was that comparison acknowledged. Uh, it wasn't mentioned anywhere in my review. Uh, but I think it's important uh, to include that because it adds gravitas. It shows how serious you are about taking this thing through and understanding some of the legal implications for it. Because the last thing they want is for another person to appear in court in the way that Pamela Coughlin did, because of the headache that the NHS have had over the outcome of that case. So it is important to show that you understand the legality of the issue. So it took me 18 months to get from checklist to award, but the important point is that persistence does pay off. And when I was, you know, when we got to the, after 12 months when the wars refused, we did feel very down, you know, disheartened. But again, the advice was to keep on going and eventually we'll get there. Another key point is the postcode lottery aspect. I think having discussed that, I told you how bad Wiltshire is. It's important to understand where a candidate lives and in some cases that make it may make it very easy in some cases it might make it very difficult but it's a good it's uh, it's good to understand that before you start out because it will set your expectations and then last but not least um very important point is the strain on the individual and their family that this thing causes I mean, we were we were seriously stressed about this thing. I mean, this this is uh, this is this is a really important thing. You know, this uh, the fact that CHC isn't being tested, being tested in social services is, you know, this can this can be the difference between you know living living the life you want to lead and being on the breadline and. Uh, for it to carry on as long as it does, for it to be so unlawful as it is, it's uh, it's it's, it's a terrible strain. Um, I asked my mum what she thought of the process, and she said she thought it was cruel and abusive uh, of people that are you know people like me who had just had this accident, this terrible life changing thing, and you know other people would be just as vulnerable, if not more vulnerable potentially with no one else to fight their corner for them. And you've got this terrible, horrible, hostile process. And, you know, for an elderly person, no one else to fight their, their corner, they would have no chance. And this is care that they are lawfully entitled to. So, yeah, so thanks for your attention. And I hope this has been, hope this has been informative.